think for me, one of the things we look at and we track with our clients and program members is heart rate variability as a metric because it gives us that understanding of the tension point between the push and pull, right? The, the strain and the recovery. And so for those uh, listeners that haven't heard of it, heart rate variability shows us if it's higher generally speaking, you're in much better health in terms of your nervous system. And so in some individuals, what we'll see is that when they're pushing too hard, they ignore the signs. If they can see it as a metric, like you were saying, people who are really on that success ladder, you know, had I been able to see that my sleep, I knew I was getting you know, short number of hours, but if I've been really able to see just how little and how that was affecting my heart rate variability and my health metrics, would I have changed things? You know, would I have slowed down? Would I have gone out less? There was very much among lawyers, a play hard, work hard mentality. All right, Angela, I am so pumped up and so excited to have you on this episode. I know you and I have been talking and going back and forth about this podcast episode for a while. And, you know, we have life and kids and you're halfway across the world with different time zones. And it's just been a little bit, a little bit tricky finding spots that work for both of us. So thanks for making it and being here today. Thank you for having me and yeah, for your patience as well. I know it's always tricky when we're trying to get calendars together. It was such a great episode when you came on my show. So I'm happy to be back with you today. Yeah, I know. It's always funny. Like it's great that we have those world availability to be able to connect with people all around the world. But it's a whole time zone thing that I was like growing up. It was never even across my mind. Like how do we coordinate time zones with people that are on completely different schedules and their world's in a completely different spot. So yes, thank you so much for being here. I am so excited. I know you and I are really in the same kind of vein in the same space and really helping women learn to listen to their own bodies and learn to listen to what's happening in their bodies and taking their bodies to that next level where they can really optimize it and use it and leverage it. And I know you have your your system around biosyncing and really coining that term and that phrase of really syncing with your biology. So tell me before we like dive into all that and like how women can really use their bodies to become high performers, like tell us a little bit about your story. Like how did you get here? How is this now the thing that you're talking about? Crazy route, right? Because I yeah. started out as a corporate lawyer. So I was working in London. I mean, just crazy hours. We definitely didn't respect sleep or hormonal balance or really look after nutritional fitness. You know, it was just everything to get the deal done and very much like working, pulling all nighters, working weekends. Mm -hmm. And in my twenties, I just felt pretty invincible. It seemed like, yeah, I can handle this. It's fine. You know, I was on that career track. And I think for me, it wasn't then until I started thinking about having a family that Mm -hmm. I realized actually I'd been taking birth control, ignoring a whole host of hormonal issues that my medical doctor had said, we'll just park those and deal with, you know, when you decide you want to start a family. And so it then turned out that I had PCOS and endometriosis. Mm -hmm. I had surgery. They sort of said to me, you know, we've, we've cut away all the endometriosis. You've probably got about six months because it will regrow now is the best time if you want to have a child I was going for partnership at the law firm so it all kind of felt crazy and I was like Mm -hmm. can I really go for two massive goals at the same time and I was like well I'll go for both and if one happens you know great if both happens that'll be amazing and then I made partnership when I was eight months pregnant with my first child so it was all a bit of a whirlwind and then I went on my maternity leave and I was three months pregnant when I came back so it was when I was due to come back so it was all a bit crazy but I think for me what I wasn't prepared for was the postpartum depression that I struggled Mm. with and at first I was in denial but that got really bad after my second child and I think that the whole background really of burnout probably set the stage for it but then when you've kind of gone somewhere right with your mental health you can go there again. And after my third child, it got really entrenched. And that was when I was really struggling. So by the time she was two, I was then Mm -hmm. diagnosed with major depressive disorder with Mm -hmm. bipolar episodes. And so it was a real struggle to kind of control my thoughts. And I was Mm -hmm. having a lot of therapy. I was on a lot of different medications. And I ended up getting flu and then ultimately being hospitalized, which turned out to be pneumonia. And that was a massive turning point for me because I'd kind of hit that rock bottom of my physical health, my mental health. At that point, I felt like I'd created this prison in my own mind, you know, where I just I just wanted to turn the thoughts off. I didn't know how to escape. And I think those thoughts of ending my life had kind of taken such an effect on my immune system. Mm -hmm. that that was really the turning point. And that led ultimately to me changing complete directions and figuring out how can we be healthy and have high performance at the same time. 
Yes. I think there's a lot of women, like I've seen it a lot in the last few years, a lot of really high performing women that I've watched and seen them like rising online, getting to this point where now they've hit this level of success that they want. But then looking back, they're like, wow, I lost all of these health metrics. I like wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't sleeping. And so now I've seen quite a few women actually coming back and saying, Like this is their year. Like they've started implementing these things. They've started kind of sleeping better. They've started eating better, taking care of their body better. Like realizing that the success that we've idolized so much in society, it's costing a lot of women. And so what I am all about and what you are all about is like, how do we achieve those success? And how do we achieve those goals? How do we achieve that thing that we want without having to sacrifice our bodies? And actually in the back end of it, it was like, how do we use our bodies to actually achieve those goals and achieve those success? And so it's funny, you said something earlier about sacrificing sleep in when you were working and things like that. Even just last night, I was tucking my oldest into bed. She's 12. And she's like, I haven't finished my homework assignment because when we were out last night and her computer has like a a timer. So like it turns off at a certain time of night. So she couldn't keep working on her homework while my husband and I were gone. So by the time we got home, she's like, it it turned off and I couldn't finish my assignment because the computer. And so she was all stressed about it last night. And I was like, honey, I don't care if you don't get the assignment done. You can go to bed. Like, it's okay. Like go to bed. Don't worry about the assignment tonight. And so I think that there is this, I mean, it comes from very early on. I remember as a teenager and middle schooler, like staying up really late, trying to get assignments done, trying to get things, you know, put together so I could turn it into school the next day. And so it was almost like sacrificing that sleep and getting things done was rewarded in a lot of different ways. So what have you seen? And like, what does that landscape look like for you in terms of having women be able to really become functioning high achievers, achieving big goals, but doing it in this way that's much more sustainable and like really cares for their body? It's a great question. I mean, I think for me, one of the things we look at and we track with our clients and program members is heart rate variability as a metric, because it gives us that understanding of the tension point between the push and pull, right? The the strain and the recovery. And so for those uh, listeners that haven't heard of it, heart rate variability shows us if it's, if it's higher, generally speaking, you're in much better health in terms of your nervous system. And so in some individuals, what we'll see is that when they're pushing too hard, they ignore the signs. If they can see it as a metric, like you were saying, people who are really on that success ladder, you know, had I been able to see that my sleep, I knew I was getting you know, short number of hours, but if I've been really able to see just how little and how that was affecting my heart rate variability and my health metrics, would I have changed things? You know, would I have slowed down? Would I have gone out less? There was very much among lawyers a play hard, work hard mentality. And I think sometimes that data can help. Mm -hmm. I also think when you start to work with women and understand them and, and help them understand that you know, flow, for example, flow states is another area we focus on in our program, that that drives higher productivity. You know, McKinsey's research shows that if we are in a state of flow, we're five times more productive. In theory, that could mean you go into work on a Monday and you don't come back for a week if you could maintain flow all day. But understanding what are the flow blockers, because we're in a really, really distracted world at the moment. And people are finding it harder and harder to focus and concentrate. And I think time will always expand to the task given so we're taking longer but also Mm -hmm. recognizing well if I'm tired and I'm slow and I'm sluggish and I've got these hormonal issues and I'm not feeling balanced and happy and my mood is off are you really achieving more like and are you Mm -hmm. even achieving your true potential or if you take more recovery will that turbocharge it and I think yeah I would say to my clients why don't you adopt the mindset of an athlete an athlete does not believe that they're going to just get this next deal through they are always tracking their sleep their nutrition their recovery Mm -hmm. getting massage getting the stresses and strains out of their body doing breath work you know they're looking at the whole individual holistically and I think for high performers if you can approach it and honor yourself like an athlete does Mm -hmm. we can still have high performance and perhaps even higher performance in many cases certainly over the longer term Yeah, I think that that's amazing. You know, heart rate variability was not something that I really knew about or was tracking until I started the Aura Ring. 
And having the aura ring like every day giving me data on that heart rate variability, it is such a great insight. And even, I mean, honestly, just wearing the aura ring has given me so much insight into what's actually happening inside my body. What It's the way I track my basal body temperature and knowing where my hormones are at throughout the month. And just having more of this awareness of like what's actually happening inside of our bodies. Do you think that this is a trend that you see is going to continue to advance that like the people that are starting to pay attention to understanding what's happening in their bodies and not just taking everything for granted is this like I feel like sometimes I think I'm in this little pocket of the the people that I'm around we were talking about this last night like go into a different pocket of the world or a different pocket of mm. people and you're like whoa nobody's doing this or nobody knows about this so do you think that it is this little pocket or do you see that this is where the next generation of the world is going I think it is a growing trend. I think you're right in so far as I, I totally agree. And I think when you're in something, you almost don't know any different. You assume, well, yeah. like, why doesn't everyone know what I'm talking about when I say heart rate variability? And maybe people have never heard about it. But I think it is a growing trend. And I think mm -hmm. that recovery, certainly, and when we look at health and biohacking, I think it's going to get a lot bigger. Before, it was all about how can I create more stress, right? How can I do high intensity, CrossFit, all yeah. these different things, fasting, right, which is another stress on the body, even though it's sort of rebooting it. Now, if we look at where people are going, it's much more in the meditation, in the direction of meditation, breath work, cold exposure, which reduces mm -hmm. inflammation. And, and all of those things are enhancing recovery. And I think now the sort of two worlds are coming together where, mm. you know, the people who were doing it without tracking are now appreciating the science behind what they're doing and why it works. And I do think we'll see that opening up, particularly as these wearables are getting so much better in terms of the technology they can offer. Yeah. Well, and you just brought up something too, like we can backtrack a little bit is that maybe somebody listening doesn't know what heart rate variability is. Like I just kind of jumped in with that. So would you mind kind of explaining that for people so that they know what that is? Yeah. So when we're looking at heart rate variability, everybody knows what heart rate is. OK, so we can measure our pulse and then we'll see what it's beating at. An easy example would be if your heartbeat was 60 beats per minute, your heart rate, then you might assume that it must be beating one beat every second because it's 60 beats a minute. That's not actually the case. And when you look, if you watch any kind of TV programs where people are in AR room or a &E, we call it here, you'll see that when they get hooked up to a, you know, the cardiovascular machine, you can see all these kind of the graph going up and down. And that is heart rate variability. So it's the interbeat variability and it's measured in milliseconds. There's various ways of measuring it, but there should be high variability, not too high, but it should be high or higher. Now, how high it is, is very individual because part of that is age, part of it is genetics, part of it is lifestyle. So we can't control all of the variables, but we can and we shouldn't compare to other people. But we can establish a baseline. And when we know what our baseline is, is if it starts to reduce, that's indicating that we are having more strain than physiologically we're able to cope with over the longer term. So we're not building adaptive capacity. So if we go to the gym and you're training and you lift a weight, you are causing strain to the body and breaking down, tearing those muscle fibers to make it bigger and make it grow and you come back more resilient. That's how stress should work in any situation that you're coming back and hopefully you're not just resilient, but you're anti-fragile, right? You bounce forward and you're stronger than ever before. If heart rate variability starts to drop from what is your kind of standard baseline, we need to introduce more recovery because when the heart recognizes disorder, whether that's outside of the body or because of your thoughts or because of how badly you've been eating or you're dehydrated, it will try to create order. And so what it does is it just becomes much more rhythmic in nature. And we see that by a drop in heart rate variability. Okay. I love that. And I know you, we talked about a little bit too before is this idea of like the women and the people that want to make this shift, right. And want to increase and enhance this heart rate variability. What are those things? And what are those practices that they can do? Like you talked about, like there are things that are genetic and there's things that we cannot change, but what things can we change and what things can we use to maximize that heart rate variability, that bio syncing and really in honoring and, in using and leveraging like our bio individuality, like all of those types of things. So one of the first things I would say is to sync with your circadian rhythm. And I think not enough of us are doing it, right? I mm -hmm. definitely wasn't doing that as a lawyer. And I know it's a real problem for shift workers in particular. Yeah. 
But when you're out of sync with your circadian rhythm, it's affecting all of the clock genes within the body. So behind the eye, we have the superchiasmatic nucleus or the SCN, and that's the master clock. And it's communicating to the clocks in the liver and all the other organs what time things are going to happen. It also has a big impact on our hormonal health and when we produce things like cortisol and melatonin. Mm. And so I think the first thing is actually to get in alignment. Now, I'm not going to say the rise and fall of the sun, because as you know, in the yeah. northern hemisphere, I mean, it's dark here now is 5 30 actually in january it's pretty much light only between 8 a.m and about 4 p.m so we're not going to get up at 8 go to bed at 4 right but however if we think about the equatorial day somewhere between sort of a six to six routine we definitely want to be dimming the lights in the evening and you know andrew huberman talks about the fact that between 10 p.m and 4 a.m that is the critical window that we want to block blue light exposure. So if people are working for whatever reason into the evening, using filters on your laptops or your screens, on your TV, putting blue light blocking glasses, there's a very easy setting on the iPhone that you can go into the settings. And then once you've set it up, you triple click and it will turn the phone to red and you triple click in the morning and it comes back to blue. Hmm. So I think this circadian alignment and getting good quality sleep and good deep sleep, good REM sleep is fundamental. Going outside, getting morning light, that Mm -hmm. is going to help. So coming in sync with your physiology, rhythm of the heart is going to respond well to that. Some of the other things would be improving hydration levels. Often we are dehydrated, we're just not drinking enough water. Caffeine can have an effect. Stress levels are thoughts. So journaling can be really, really helpful. You know, syncing with your goals and your values and making sure that you're in alignment. That's really the core of biosyncing. What we see is greater resonance. And when we see people who are living in sync with their highest values, what I've seen in my program members is their heart rate variability increases, it improves. And that's different for everyone. That's the bio-individual piece. So for some people, they may love their work and hopefully you do. And and what you're doing is really in resonance with your values. For other people, I've seen mums who love just being with their kids. And even in the morning where it's super busy and they're rushing for the school run, they're doing a family breakfast and they're in higher heart rate variability than in sleep because it's so much in resonance. And I think understanding this vibration is also important. Cold exposure is great. Mm -hmm. There's all these different things, right? And I don't want people to feel overwhelmed. What I would say is the first thing is kind of check in with yourself and see where you're at. You know, if you're Mm -hmm. waking up really low in energy and you feel like you don't have that capacity and hopefully some of the things we're talking about, you can start to address from a lifestyle perspective. For sure. And I think it is just becoming aware of how things impact you and how they impact your body. And for instance, like I have not been drinking alcohol. I have haven't drank much at all in months. And if so, it's just like one or two here and there. But last night I went out to dinner with some family that were visiting in town and I was like, ooh, that margarita looks really good. I'm going to order the margarita. And then later I was looking at my aura ring before I went to bed and I was like looking at just the day. And it said that I was in a high stress level from that like moment that I was drinking the alcohol till the point that I was getting ready to go to bed. And I was like, oh, how interesting, like the stress levels that it noticed in my body during that point. And so I think it is really just becoming aware of, like for me, that was part of why I stopped drinking alcohol was I noticed how much it was impacting my sleep, even would drink just one glass of something. I wouldn't sleep very well. Like I would fall asleep fine and I would be asleep But I would notice the next morning that I would wake and I wouldn't feel rested. I was tossing and turning like it just was not a very restorative sleep for the night. And so for me, it wasn't worth drinking a glass of wine or beer or whatever every so often for that outcome. And so I think it does just kind of come down to looking at what those things are for us and making the small changes, like changing the small little things and knowing for me, giving up alcohol and caffeine and things like that, like they weren't big changes that I had to make but they've had massive outcomes on the other end. Mm. Like it's changed so much. So I think, like you said, it's kind of looking at like, what are those small little things that people can shift? Alcohol, sadly, is a big one. It's a killer for REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And that REM sleep is tightly linked to heart rate variability. I gave up alcohol. It initially started as a 90-day thing. Uh And now I'm 18 months in. And I have to say, my energy is definitely higher. Like, I have way more capacity. And and you're right, right? It doesn't take very much. One or two drinks. Sadly, I'm not suggesting anyone gives up alcohol because I know it can be a fun part of life. But just be aware that you're going to need to layer in a few more recovery elements. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just having that awareness. Like, I think when I've talked about it, a lot of the people in the circles that I'm around, like some of them haven't noticed that alcohol is doing that to them. So it was like years ago when I stopped eating a bunch of sugar at one point, it was like when I ate a candy bar and my body just went through major sugar crash. I was like, oh, this is how my body has been handling. And this is what it felt like all the time. I think sometimes that even like you talked about at the beginning, that road to burnout, sometimes we just normalize the way we're feeling. We normalize how much energy we have, like this chronic mantra in society of like, we need caffeine to keep us going. We're dragging all the time. Like we've normalized a lot of these things that are not necessarily the way we have to live, right? Like mm. we don't have to be dragging on and needing a cup of coffee every morning to wake ourselves up. We don't have to be using a glass of wine to fall asleep every night. Like we don't need to be using these things, but yeah, we've normalized a lot of it in our society. It's very yeah. true. Yeah. yeah. So somebody out there is wanting to dig into this more and they're wanting to be able to learn a little bit more about like how to biosync to all these other parts of their bodies. Like I know I focus in on how do we use our menstrual cycle, which I know you use as well. But if they're wanting to really look and dig into this heart rate variability and how their body shifts, like where and how can they go deeper in this and how can they work a little bit more with you? Thank you. Yeah. So I think if they're using some trackers, that is a great way, like you were saying with your aura ring, because the data shows you, and I'm not saying we should hang everything on the data. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, you wouldn't want to do that because you want to go with your intuition as well. Even mm -hmm. having a simple journal about what you're noticing and how you feel. And if you're going off track, I think one thing to remember is that we crave what we repeatedly do. So mm -hmm. you probably notice that when you're working out and you skip a day, you can't wait to get back and work out. Yeah. But when you skip, five days all of a sudden it's like oh I really can't be asked to go work out again you know <laughs> and I think this is the thing so I think like tracking what's going on just yourself in your journal is really really helpful for you to get insights and looking at things like your hormone balance but if you want to get a snapshot then we have a kind of biohacking quiz that your listeners can take where we'll score you on what we call our shift protocol. So how do you shift into optimal health for high performance? And shift essentially is an acronym for sleep, for hormones, for the insights you're tracking, the way you're fueling your body and the way you're training your body and mind. And that fuel mm -hmm. component, the reason I say fuel and not food is when you're thinking, how can I fuel my body for high performance? If you can remember this, if you remember flow, because it's not just about food, it's food like oxygen and water. So, and water really just for hydration, right? That's what I mean there, mm -hmm. but it fits nicely. How do I get flow? And so with light, we know that it really impact, impacts our circadian rhythm as we've been speaking about, but also the health of our mitochondria, which again is really important for energy. So seeing mm -hmm. the sun at sunrise or sunset, Using things like red light therapy devices, really, really important. That charges our cells and gives us energy. We want to be breathing correctly. That's so important, getting enough oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. And slowing down our breathing. I don't know if you've seen that with your clients, but, you know, sometimes on the Aura Ring, what you'll see is people who have a very high breathing rate, right? And yeah. it's because they're quite stressed. So it's kind of up at 19, 20 breaths a minute. And when you think, when you slow it down, you know, the average should be about 12 and a half breaths a minute, we can slow it down even more, but beyond that. Mm. So looking at these metrics is really helpful. And then the T in shift is how do I train my body and my mind? Because mm -hmm. training the mind is equally important through mindfulness and meditation and visualizations. And so we actually score people on each area of shift. It takes like less than 60 seconds to take the quiz. And then we send you a free personalized report where we'll give you your scores in each area, complete with recommendations on how you can begin to improve. That's so good. Yeah. And I actually was, that was going to be my question was like the, what are the components of that quiz and like what the elements that you work in? So I love that it comes in that shift like word as well. And one thing to kind of go on what you talked about, like with breathing is like, as I've become a breathwork facilitator this last year, I've noticed that before I wasn't breathing. I would do these big, long breath holds, which were, I think the same kind of stress indicator, not necessarily like breathing fast all the time, but like I was holding my breath all the time. And so once I became aware, like, oh, I am like holding my breath and that breath hold consistently all the time was decreasing the oxygen that my body was having and increasing that stress load and things like that. So it's been really interesting to watch 
and become aware of all of these little factors, right? Like how you're sleeping, how you're taking care of your body, how you're fueling your body, how you're creating this mindfulness, like all of these different pieces and how they all contribute to how your body actually functions, like how we actually run. And then that then precipitates into what we're able to do and what we're able to live and like how we want to live. Like I know for a lot of my clients and stuff, they want to be able to like, I like one of my goals. I'm like, I want to be 80 years old and be able to get down on the floor and play with my great great grandkids. Like I want to be able to do these things. And it all comes from now really like honoring and supporting our body where it's at. A hundred percent. And I think people should have big goals, right? Like that. Yeah. Some people want to cross country ski in their eighties. What about the fact that even just being able to travel and lift your luggage into the overhead locker mm-hmm. is really important. It's something we do. We have a membership called the Female Biohacker Collective, where it's like a low cost membership for people who just want to improve their life month on month. And we do different challenges in there. And one of the challenges we've done recently is a longevity challenge. So it's like assess mm-hmm. yourself on fitness. Like where are you today? And what's the trajectory of that? If we future pace you are you going to be strong enough and have a high enough vo2 max and enough flexibility that you can pick up the grandkids get on the floor with them travel and do all these things run between our airport terminals and i think that kind of future pacing of looking ahead is motivational because we often just think in the immediate term right it's new year i need to make some changes maybe i need to lose a bit of weight but there's nothing really where's the why behind that there's nothing Mm -hmm. exciting behind that and that's why i think we fall off track so easily at new year whereas if you got a really big audacious goal around it I think you're more likely to be compliant yeah it's kind of like having that why behind it like why am I working out why am I eating well why am I doing all these things and for a lot of people unfortunately it comes from a massive you know, hiccup in that, whether it be like a cancer or whether it be a stroke or whether it be something that then, but at that point, not not that it's too late, but it's like, we've done so much damage that we could have prevented in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, So true. So So if we can be inspired by bigger stories, right, that we we sell ourselves on, that's so much better. It's positive, put that energy into positive energy. For sure. I know even just recently I was watching, you know, there's a couple of Instagram feeds that I follow that are like amazing, inspirational sorts of things and seeing these, you know, 80, 90 year olds running and doing a triathlon or doing, you know, and it's like, wow, you really can do what you put your mind to and like how you treat your body. And it doesn't come like that 89 year old chances are he didn't wait till he was 70 to start taking care of his body. He was doing it all along, like taking care of his body all along. And I think that's just a really powerful thing to kind of pull in. So I know this is amazing. And I know that this is going to resonate so much for people that are listening. If they want to connect with you, find you, follow you, where would be the best place other than the quiz, which I would definitely recommend people go over and do, where else would you want them to come find you? So I probably am most active on Instagram, which is at Angela S. Foster. That's where I share a lot of reels and like graphics and things to really help people put these things in place. And also on my podcast, which Renee has been on, High Performance Health, you can come and listen to that. We, I think yours went out a couple of months back. So yeah, probably the podcast or Instagram, or if you just want to go and get a feel for everything about us, then go to my website, AngelaFosterPerformance.com. So good. Angela, thank you so much for coming on. This was amazing. I totally appreciate it. And I hope you have a fabulous day. Thank you. All righty, friend. It was such a pleasure to hang out with you today on today's episode. I cannot wait to do it again with you next week. So save the date. We'll meet here again. Until then, if you haven't already, be sure to leave a review on the podcast, letting us know what you love about this podcast. After you do that, submit a screenshot of that to support at reneefic.com and you will be entered in to be able to have one of our free spots inside of your cycle 101, our foundational program, letting you know the ins and the outs of how your cycle impacts you every single day. Alrighty friend, I will see you next week.